What's up, y'all? My name is JR, and for those of you who don't already know, I'm a huge movie and TV nerd. If you're new here, I appreciate you taking the time to check out my channel, and I hope you'll consider sticking around and joining the film community I'm trying to build here on YouTube. So, in today's video, I'm going to be talking about Indiana Jones and the Dial of Destiny, and why I think the movie is actually a fairly decent one, despite what people are saying about it online. And I want to take a moment to let you guys know that this particular video will contain some mild spoilers. So, if you haven't seen the movie yet and you plan to, and you're not trying to hear about anything that happens, you might want to exit this video right now. And with that being said, no more wasting time. Let's get into it. So, let me start by addressing the issue that a lot of people seem to have with the runtime of this film. Yes, the movie may be a tad longer than it absolutely needed to be, with a runtime of approximately 154 minutes. But, I do want to make a point that that's pretty much right in line with all the other big budget action adventure films released in theaters these days. Two and a half hours has become pretty much standard for these types of films. And if I'm being honest, it was exactly what I expected when I went to go see this movie. The production design was absolutely immaculate in this film. And with the film being a period piece, I always pay special attention to those types of details. Now, the film's budget is listed at $300 million on both IMDb and Wikipedia, so I was expecting things like that to be up to par. The story, from a macro perspective, was one that was interesting enough, even though it's one we've seen over and over in television and films to this point. Dealing with time travel is always interesting because you wonder what the writer of the film's philosophy on this kind of stuff is and what they've decided to say about the subject, even though in most cases it's merely used as a plot device. As for the characters, I thought the two main characters were both serviceable in this instance. I thought both the jobs Harrison Ford and Phoebe Waller-Bridge did in bringing the characters to life, or reviving in Harrison Ford's case, and the chemistry between the pair were really good. And with that being said, I wanted to take a moment to say this. I think Phoebe Waller-Bridge is absolutely getting a bad rap in this movie. I think people look at her and some of the things she's written and produced in the past, mostly the way she handled James Bond in No Time to Die. And those feelings have clouded the way they see her in this film. I personally think she was good in this film. I think she took a character with an interesting arc and she made that character her own. Now, her character in the film is clearly feminist minded which might also trigger some people. But the character is so much more than that if you're willing to look deeper. At the beginning of the film, Helena is looking for the film's MacGuffin, the fictional Archimedes Dial, also known as the Antikythera. I don't know if I said that right, but whatever. And she seems to be just fine with sacrificing anybody in order to get it, including her long-lost godfather, Dr. Henry Walton Jones Jr., or one Indiana Jones. Now, the movie starts with Indy and Basil trying to steal an artifact from the Germans at the end of World War II. They both get caught, but while Basil is being held captive by Nazi soldiers on a train, he overhears one Dr. Voller talk of a device that makes time travel possible. And once Indy escapes his captors and rescues Basil, he is told of the device's existence as well. Now, while the pair of them are on the train, they manage to get their hands on this device. And as they attempt to escape with it, of course, shenanigans ensue. But eventually they do end up escaping the Nazi soldiers with the device in hand and Indy gives Basil the device to hold for safekeeping. Now, we then catch up to Indy several years later, living alone in New York, sorrowful over the death of his son and the pending separation of he and his wife. 
We see him teaching a class, trying pretty hard to get his students to engage as he gives a lecture on the siege of Syracuse. And that's where we see Phoebe Waller Bridges character, Helena, sitting in the back of the class, answering all of his questions. After the class, we see that Indy is retiring from his professor job. And then we watch as Helena follows him to a bar where she reintroduces herself as his long lost goddaughter before asking if she can see the half of the dial that Indy got from Basil all those years ago. Now, Indy agrees to show her the dial, but we find out that Helena is being followed by goons <laughs> sent by Dr. Vola to retrieve the artifact. And as Indy takes Helena into the storage area at the university to see the half of the dial he has stored there, they are set upon by said goons. And in all the ruckus, Helena takes the artifact and escapes from the room, leaving Indy behind basically as a decoy so she can get away. Now, why did I just go through all that? I did it to explain where this character is at the beginning of the film. She's a very selfish person at the beginning of the story, so much so that she would purposely put her godfather in danger and then leave him behind to face that danger all alone, all so she could get her hands on an artifact to sell on the black market for profit. Now, as the film goes on, and the pair go off together to find the other half of the dial, she and Indy both realize that, with Indy's son dead and being estranged from his wife, and her father having died some time ago, that they are literally all each other has left. So, we watch the two of them get closer as the story progresses, which is shown through Helena's willingness to leave Indy behind when the proverbial shit hits the fan. Until finally at the end of the film, when they have located all parts of the machine and Indy is both shot and captured by Dr. Voller and his goons, Helena is determined to rescue him. She literally travels through time to the siege of Syracuse in 214 BC to rescue Indy. And even when he asked her more than once to leave him in the past to die from his wounds, she finds a way to get him back to his own time to get the medical attention that he needs. And she even manages to solve his outstanding issue to boot. I bring all this up again, you know, because it turns out that this film is really about Helena. Despite Harrison Ford being in it, playing one of the most iconic male heroes of the last 50 years, it's about her journey from being a shady, self-centered, black market criminal, for lack of a better term, to being someone who values the people closest to her enough to risk herself to help them and make their lives better. Now, I think that might be why so many people were concerned that Phoebe Waller-Bridge might be replacing Harrison Ford in future films in the franchise some time ago. But knowing what we know now, I, I certainly don't think that's the case. What I think we had here was the final film in the Indiana Jones franchise, you know, of fingers crossed, you know, and a film where the main character was not the most famous character or actor in it. And I've heard some people say that the writers made Helena better than Indy at pretty much everything, but I didn't see the character that way at all. What I did see was an Indiana Jones that was still wildly capable for his age and a woman 30 some odd years his junior tagging along for the ride. I mean, yes, she's intelligent, but that tracks being that her father was an archaeologist and a professor at Oxford. So it makes perfect sense that she would be both interested and well versed in the things that her father was. As for the rest, I simply saw it as her being an adventurist, which also makes sense in this case. Now, in the film, there were some things she did that were kind of amazing, chief among them riding a motorcycle down the runway in the rain and hopping onto Dr. Volta's plane in order to rescue Indy. But if I'm being completely honest, that's nothing outside the realm of expectation when it comes to films like this. In fact, I seem to remember watching another film some years ago where people were trying to hop on a plane while it was trying to take off. 
That movie was Fast and the Furious 6. Besides, actors do things in these types of movies all the time that they can't do in real life. So, I, for one, am not really prepared to come for Phoebe Waller-Bridge's neck over the way she was presented in this film. As for the rest of the story, it progresses pretty much like you would expect in these type of films. Even the twist in the movie was exactly what I expected, given what the movie was about. Now, I won't spoil that for those of you who haven't seen the movie yet. Now, there are, of course, a few plot points that are both lazy and ridiculous, like Dr. Voller knowing exactly where to find Indy and Helena based off of him seeing what direction they travel in a boat while escaping capture on the Aegean Sea through a pair of binoculars. Or the young man, Teddy, having no experience flying a plane, but then being able to hotwire one under immense pressure and fly it with some level of proficiency as he chased Dr. Voller's plane through a porthole to 214 BC. But with all that being said, the film does manage to, as I like to put it, land the plane fairly smoothly in both a fairly simple and clever manner. I won't spoil that for you guys either, but I'll just say I was pleasantly surprised by the way the movie ended. To make a long story short, I thought the film was good. Much better than I thought it would be based on all the bad reviews I have been seeing from other YouTubers who saw the film before its initial release. If I were being asked, I would give the film a 6.5 out of 10. And for context on what that means to me, I tend to tell people that if a film is a 6 or better out of 10, that's a good movie. If it's an 8 out of 10 or better, that's a great movie. And if a film manages a 9 out of 10 or better, that's a film that will be on a list of some kind at some point. But let's be really, really clear about something. There are no perfect movies. I can think of a few in the last 20 years or so that have maybe come close. Nines or so. But a perfect film just isn't a thing. Indiana Jones and the Dial of Destiny is a serviceable action adventure film. One that I can admit was fairly entertaining. Now, as far as the business of this film, that's another matter. As we look at the film's box office numbers, as of July 1, the film has made approximately $152 million worldwide, which means the movie will need to make another 550 or so million to see Black Ink, assuming the budget listed on IMDb and Wikipedia is accurate. You know, I always tell people that films usually need a clear two and a half times the budget in order for the film to make it into profit. But I also need you guys to understand that the budgets that these films report aren't always accurate and sometimes they're not even close. Sometimes they're used to gain the audience into supporting the film. But I do think in this case, 700 million or so is the number. And even though I thought the film was a creative success, by all accounts, again, despite what some people have to say about it, I'm not sure at the rate that it's going, the film will be a financial one. But what do you guys think? Do you think Indiana Jones and the Dial of Destiny was a good film? Do you think it'll make its money back? Or do you think Paramount, Lucasfilm, and Disney have a financial train wreck on his hands? Let me know in the comments. And for those of you who might be new to the channel, be sure to like and subscribe. That way you'll be notified when I drop a new video. Also, be sure to go check out themadscreenwriter.com for more television and film reviews and info on my upcoming film projects. And with that, I'm going to go ahead and get out of here. I got screenplays to write. I'll catch y'all on the next video.